Um, okay, uh, thanks, uh, Russia. Thanks, uh, museum team for uh, hosting us and hosting this amazing event. Um, I, 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 I'm not going to present, uh, of course, uh, Salim. He's uh, mo yani, uh, more important than I can be uh, presenting him. I'm so happy to be doing this. I mean, um, we are trying to do, I mean, this, this kind of presentation is based on a, on a piece that I did with Riwaq, uh, like last year, and was screened in, uh, in the Berinale Forum Expanded exhibition. And uh, it's basically uh, a new trial of making more work on, on archive and somehow finding um, a 3D dimension, uh, not only for the image, but also for our understanding for uh, that period. Um, I, I would like Salim to go directly because this is the most important uh, part. And um, yeah, I will come after that and we continue uh, about this topic together. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Rasha Salti and the organizers of this great conference for inviting us. This is a great occasion to be here with Mohanna Yaqoubi, who is not only a colleague but and a brilliant uh, uh, perceptor of the great possibilities inherent in the technology of uh, photography, but happens to be a, a descendant of the great uh, Palestinian poet who, like the subject I'm going to discuss, is almost totally unknown today. I'm talking about Sheikh uh, Abu al-Iqbal, uh, Salim al-Yaqoubi, the mufti of, the, of Lidda and the main imam of uh, the mosque of Jaffa. Uh, he was a great figure in the Ottoman period and like the subject I'm going to discuss, uh, has uh, vanished with it and hopefully through Muhannad we can revive both the period and the dynasty of this great family. <laughs> uh, the subject I'm going to discuss with you is exploration in a vanished city, which is a reading of the urban geography of Ottoman Jerusalem as seen by a, a witness and a great chronicler of that period by the name of Wasif Juhari. Uh, the new uh, material in this particular collection is a discovery of the original photographs that were collected by Juhari and preserved by his family in Athens. And uh, a year and a half ago, I, I took a special trip to Venice and the family kindly allowed me to make copies of that great collection which differs from the uh, Beirut collection that we had so far in that it contains immense details of annotation, description, commentaries, and classification of this photographic collection. Uh, Juhariya's collection uh, has been revived uh, through his uh, narrative of Ottoman and Mandate Jerusalem, which were published by IPS in two volumes. And today we discuss another feature of this great chronicler, which is the visual part of Ottoman Jerusalem. His uh, memoirs, uh, some of you are familiar with it, spans over 60 years of Jerusalem's history, covering the period from 1904 to 1968, which went through four regimes, five, five wars. It witnessed the transition of Palestinian society into modernity and the breakup our breakout of the Arab population outside the old uh, city beyond the walls. Shuhari himself was, above all, known as virtuoso, oud player, and bon vivant. He chronicled the bohemian world of the music of Bilad al-Sham and its main exponents in the years preceding the Great War. He has a very special notebook uh, at Dafatar al Musiqi Lawasif Johariya, which is unpublished, which uh, contains a, an inventory of the great musical bands, oud players, and theatrical groups that dominated the Jerusalem scene in the early century. 
Uh, I became interested in this subject recently because of my reading into the photographic images of the what I call the melancholic journey of Hussein Hashim al Husseini in the land of desolation. And here we see two very unique photographs. In the first one, which has become an iconic picture, uh, we see the surrender of Jerusalem by the mayor. He was commissioned by Governor Ezat Beg to sign the uh, surrender uh, papers with two sergeants, which were the uh, scouting teams of uh, General Alambi's soldiers, accompanied by the commissioner of police. And this happened on the 9th of December, 1917. And on the right, we see a desolate picture of Hussein Hashim uh, having left his position on a very uh, lonely road on a rainy day, it was December 1917, going into the unknown horizon. So it's a very iconic image of surrender, or so it seems, because that's what I read in the pictures when I saw them first uh, in the Beirut collection. And all of a sudden, we have a completely new perspective of these two images, as I will narrate in a moment. I was fascinated also by the figure of Hussein Hashim because he occupies so much in the turbulent years between 1910 and 1915. He was not only mayor, he was the son of a mayor, Salim al-Husseini, and he, on the side, undertook the construction of the port called the West Bank Port in the Dead Sea which is almost a, a joke, but at that time it was not. It was meant to bring grain from the Eastern Bank to the West Bank to support food feeding for the southern flank of the Ottoman or, uh, army in the Sinai uh, Peninsula. So this is the picture I was talking about, and all of a sudden, I saw it again. And this time, it had a caption on it which did not exist in the first collection that we had in Beirut. This was the collection that I found in um, Athena. And underneath it says, Hussein Hashem al-Husseini and his tuck carriage on the road to Susi in 1907, which is 10 years earlier than I thought the picture was. Now, Beit Susin happens to be the estate of the Husseini family, and uh, Wasif himself belonged to a family whose father was bailiff or tax collector on behalf of the Husseini family. And they often went to Beit Susin to collect taxes from the peasants in that region. So obviously, this is not a desolate road. This is the unasphalted road taking us to the estates of the Husseinis. And all of a sudden, Hussein Hashim is not a sad figure. He's not a broken figure. He's out to go get his money from Beit Susin. Where is Beit Susin? Huh? Where is Beit Susin? Beit Susin is a village in the vicinity, in the western part of the Jerusalem district. Uh, Wasif's relationship to the Husseini is uh, very well established in his narrative. It goes back to his father, who was a mukhtar of the Orthodox community and a lawyer who practiced in Sharia courts in Jerusalem. Uh, the writings of uh, Johari reflect a special relationship of patronage with that family. The writing and photography of Wasif refute the long-held notion that Jerusalem was divided by ethnic and religious quarters, which today we know as the Armenian, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim quarters. His social relations with the Husseini family, coupled by his cultural enterprises as a musician, portray a city with distinct Jerusalem communal identity that grew and competed with other identities at the time. It is the visual narrative of Johariya's photographs that gave dimension to the dynamic, changing social life that was first transformed in 1908 and abruptly ended in 1948. 
The patronage goes back to the period of Hajj Salim al-Husseini, who was mayor before. And in Athens, I found this very unique picture, which is not part of the collection, uh, showing uh, Wasif uh, holding hand with the old sheikh, who was the father of uh, Hussein Hashim, the, the mayor. He was retired by that time, and he outlived his own son. It's interesting that here, uh, uh, Wasif, uh, perhaps wearing a, a robe, I think it's like a robe de chambre, looks as if he's a dominant figure in a position where he was almost a servant to the old man. But it's the character of Wasif that comes through this uh, photograph. The side of, uh, of ethnography in this photograph is overwhelmingly sensual. There is the odial, the olfactory, and the sensual. And one uh, feature of it is the description of the scene where the musical scene is dominant. Bands, players, visiting theatrical groups, uh, all of these permeate the two volumes of his memoirs. Taken together with his diary, the albums under consideration is a sensual tour de force of the early modernity of Jerusalem. I described it as at once olfactory, audible, and above all, a visual experience. The olfactory narrative permeates his guided tours of the old city, and the celebratory mausems around that punctuates the seasons of the holy city. Uh, and I accompany this text with a description of what is what he calls the Bir Ayu picnic. Uh, every spring, the water starts flooding from the uh, regional mountains around Jerusalem, and people go and do their picnic in the Bir Ayub area. And the place is exactly where the sewage of Jerusalem is uh, running. And it's in the nature of uh, Johariya's a uh, description that the smell of the rabia, of the flowers of the spring, are mixing with the sewage of Jerusalem. And he explains how in Jerusalem mines, the two mixes together heralded the coming of the spring. But the olfactory also is replicated in many other scenes, especially going through description of street by street, shop by shop, of all the senses and the smells of the uh, seasons, the tawabil uh, in the shop of the old city through the meat market, uh, Su'l-Attari in the perfumes market. These are brought back in a very uh, concrete way in his ethnography. Uh, the gaze to the city is seen through levels of perception, through uh, what he calls Sanduq al-Ajab, the magical box, the magical lantern which developed at the time through three-dimensional photography, uh, the stereograph, it's not three-dimensional photography, it's the uh, visual experience of 3D through the stereograph and through the cinematograph, which was a very new introduction to the city. The first uh, cinema opened in, in Jerusalem uh, in 1910. And here, this picture is taken in 1915. It shows uh, the use of the cinematograph, which is the movie camera, showing the launching of a speedboat in front of the Notre Dame building going to join the Ottoman Navy in the Dead Sea, which I'll be speaking about in a minute. So this is one of the earliest use of the cinema uh, as a... Uh, military pro propaganda for the Ottomans. Wasif's collection contains a large inventory of signed photographs by colleagues, friends, but also notable members of the community. Uh, here we have a picture of the future mayor, Raghab Bek Neshashibi on the right, Ruhi Bek Al Khaldi, who in 1911 published a very important book called Sirr uh, al-Inqilab al-Uthmani, the secret of the Ottoman Revolution. And at that time, they used the word inqilab in Arabic and Turkish, uh, and still in Persian until today to mean revolution. 
so he was welcoming this great event in this, the first monograph published about the 1908 revolution. And then we have a very beautiful picture of, uh, with dedication by Khalil Sakakini, and the third one by three friends from the Nashashibi family of Wasif. He also uh, acquired a large number of uh, public, military, legal, and uh, political figures from the time. On the right, we have the stern figure of Roshan Beg, who was the Albanian uh, um, governor, not governor, uh, uh, military commander, Amir Alai, of the Jerusalem garrison. And he had a very kind relationship with... Uh, with uh, Wasif because he always assigned him in places which did not expose him to enemy fire, which was in the south, and he was actually stationed Dead Sea, which did not see much military action in the war. Here we have an example of the notation system which was meticulously recorded and inventorized in the collection. We have about 9,000 entries of this sort uh, containing picture with the notation, the description of the title, and then a narrative about the content of that title. And here is one entry uh, about uh, Musa Qasim al-Husseini, who is uh, not too distantly related to Serene, uh, to <coughs> Layla Shaheed sitting in front of us. Uh, Johari also chronicled the process of self-rule in which we learn that the majority of governors and lawyers and judges and administrators in Jerusalem were actually local people. And it was not particularly Turkish rule. You had lots of Bulgarians, Albanians, but predominantly Syrians and Palestinians. And this is a picture of the first court of appeal. One of the great um, features of uh, Johari's uh, albums is the description of each character in these photographs. So we know them by names. And he left an empty space next to some he did not recognize. But this is a great source of knowledge for the personalities and the social dynamics of that period, which exist, nothing like it exists anywhere. And Mohanad was just telling me that with the face recognition um, software, we can also replicate the knowledge of these people as they appear in other photographs. Now, not all of these are pictures of elite people. We have a, a substantial number of uh, street people, uh, street scenes, and demonstrations, which I will discuss in a moment. But one of the great features of this uh, imagery is a record of the modernity of Ottoman Jerusalem. We have a recording. This is a unique picture. Uh, it, only two of it exists of a train which no longer, no longer exists, carrying troops from... Uh, Jerusalem to al Bire near Ramallah. And that train was dismantled in 1919, so it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I recently examined the record, Wasif's record on this train, and one of the great shocking experiences is that the collective memory of the Palestinians of this train does not exist. Most people, old people I spoke with from Bire, had no memory of it. And they denied, they thought I invented this train. And without Johari, actually, uh, there's no proof of it, except one single proof that I can tell you about in the discussion if you're interested. He also established the building of new neighborhood outside the old city, introduction of the cinematograph, the entry of the gramophones into the cafes of the old city, and the electrification of the city beginning in 1915. The great event uh, was in 1908 in Jaffa Gate and in other public squares of the city, 
the declaration of the Constitution in 1908 and the celebration of the new freedoms. Uh, so here we see kids selling papers, which began to appear for the first time after a long period of suppression uh, after the declaration of the Constitution. And this very unique picture, which I could only find in the uh, Johariye collection, is uh, Governor Wali uh, Al-Quds Sharif, uh, Ali Akram Bey, addressing the crowds in Jaffa. As far as I know, this is the first ever picture of a political rally in Bilad al-Sham. Uh, there may be others, but, uh, but I haven't seen any other pictures. So this is 1908 in front of the Sarai in Jaffa with Ali Akram Beg hanging on a column which does not exist anymore in Jaffa. Uh, we also have a record of the emergence of the first free press. Uh, we have Al-Quds published by Jurji. Habib Hananiya, 1908, and uh, Philistine, published 1911 in Jaffa. Um, and those pictures were recorded also in the Johari Johari collection. In 1915, Johari records the establishment of the Red Crescent Society, which is a unique uh, organization uh, headed by Hussein Husseini, the, the despondent mayor we spoke about, and uh, involving a large number of uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Uh, it had uh, Ibrahim Antabi, Eli Eliashar, and Leah, uh, this is a very unique picture of Leah Tannenbaum, who became later the mistress of Jamal Pasha. And many people believe that, at least Johariya thinks that way, that uh, the young Turks under Jamal Pasha became swayed towards the Zionist project by his particular relationship with Ms. Tannenbaum. And it's not clear how pretty she was, but uh, it's a vague picture of her which appears. She's number three from the right. This is one of two pictures that exist of Leah Tannenbaum. And um, it, it's a very unique uh, image, actually. Wasif appears as second from the right, standing, and the number seven is under his chin. We also have still lives of scenes which have totally vanished. The carriage is in front of uh, the um, uh, Jaffa Gate. Uh, streets from within in 1908, and a record of the first cafe to be established uh, outside the city in 1900, um, to the right. It's a kind of khashabi. The picture on the left shows the famous, iconic Hamidian Tower, which uh, will be a subject of presentation by Mohammed, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And the ethnographic material in this photograph is interesting because it also shows a great amount of public expenditure and urban planning. Here we have the inauguration of Jamal Pasha Boulevard in Jaffa in 1916, and the inauguration of the first bridge on the River Jordan. One reason why the Ottomans had a navy to bring grains from the east to the west is because there was no proper bridge. So the only way to bring things from Transjordan to Palestine was through the Dead Sea, or the, the main efficient way. This bridge actually is interesting because it contains the names of the engineers, officials, and workers who were involved in the building of the bridge. Behind each picture, Wasif had recorded the names of the people involved, and you can see the numbers in red. Uh, in 1914, the army began in earnest to conscript people, and this was the process that became known as Sefer Berlik, which brought a lot of disasters to um, 
Syria and Palestine. We know that one sixth of the total population of Syria was uh, died from the war, which was the highest proportion of deaths in the whole world at the time, much more higher than Britain, France, Belgium, and Germany in, in proportional terms. Uh, during this war, Wasif was conscripted uh, and became a naval officer in the Dead Sea and was one of the happiest people, pers periods in his life, uh, mainly because he was entertaining the troops on the ship and uh, he, they, they used to call him hashish officer for reasons that I leave it to your guessing. He also chronicled the um, various crafts in the city. This is a very interesting picture of the building of the uh, Muristan church, the Baga, and he names the actual builders in it. This is a picture which is hand colored from that period. Of course, Sefer Berlik and Corvée labor is the bitter experience of the war, which he recorded very meticulously. These are uh, people doing sukhra work or corvée labor, uh, cutting tunnels and trenches all the way from southern Jerusalem to Bir Sabah. He also recorded the first protest by women. Not many women actually appear in, in Johari's pictures, but we have a unique picture from 1919 period of the leading activists. I don't know if you can call it a women's movement because it's the beginning of protest, but we have a, a picture which has Zulaikha Shabi, Hendel Husseini, and other activists from that period. Deserters were hanged, and Johari also recorded that, and he often uh, wrote the name of people who were hanged for desertion or communication with the enemy, which in that period was the British. This happened before the great mass hangings in Cannon Square, Sahad Shuhda, in Beirut in August 1915. This picture is from 1914, one of the first hangings which the Ottomans executed in, in Jerusalem. He also recorded the fate of people who went to America. And this is a picture of a family who was sent uh, from Philadelphia in 1892. And he lists what happened to them and who, were the, who they were. Uh, a unique picture is that of Khalil Sakakini, the great writer riding a camel, uh, having not shaved for many, many months. He escaped from Damascus prison where he was arrested and joined uh, uh, Prince Faisal in uh, the Arab mountain or Druze mountain, sorry, in Huran um, in 1917. And then he later the army of Prince Faisal who became King Faisal. So I end up this presentation, I hope I did not take much time, by a reference to the iconic Hamidian uh, clock tower. This was a towering architectural monument of Ottoman modernity in Jerusalem. It was designed by uh, a, a local uh, architect by the name of Sarufim, Ibrahim Sarufim and uh, to the, from the planner's point of view, it ushered the new age of constitutional freedom using a synthesis of Western um, Austrian um, architecture and Oriental themes that they thought was essentially Ottoman. The blowing up of the Hamidian clock tower in, uh, I think, February of 19, 18 was seen by Wasif Johari as a vindictive act undertaken by both Charles Ashby, the city engineer, and by General Storrs, the governor, uh, which was like their vengeance with the, from the Ottoman system. And it ushered, and in people's mind, the symbolic repression 
of the British rule and nipped the possibility of freedom and independence that they hoped would be coming from the proclamation of the Constitution of 1908. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Salim, uh, for this. It's great. <clears throat> this is every time that happens when I'm when I hear Salim speaking, like, and seeing the images, like, it's uh, there is a whole uh, history uh, that's been uh, shaded, uh, that's been in a way that we hear about it, we can't imagine what we are see what we are uh, hearing. We see, even when we see, there is always a perspective that uh, we see from. Um, I mean, I've been living in uh, Ramallah for uh, 20 years. I maybe went two times to Jerusalem uh, in Ramallah, and uh, only by looking at uh, the, the the text and the, especially the Wasif Johariya diaries, Wasif Johariya diaries it doesn't only give a, a, a social dis description of the place, but as much it gives like a, a, an insight and a perspective, a way to look at the city. It's, it's a way that would be like my way or any local or any Palestinian living in, 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 in Palestine would be looking. It's uh, more of the, the, the life, the cafes, the, the picnic places. It's basically the, the back, back, backdrop uh, connection, social connection between the people, like the way he described uh, the families living in their neighborhood, the way he describes the 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 celebration and the events that happen it's just uh, someone that is uh, that is local it's um, i wanna before i will show i'll show the piece that i did i want to you know what i will do something just excuse me for a sec so I can see as well, arrangement, mirror display, yes, okay. So all of, all of, all of these uh, descriptions and image and history and Ottoman and mandate and Belfort, all of that happens in, uh, in this area here. I mean, this is the the whole space. I mean, I was I was like, because uh, like reading a lot about it, and then like, okay, how does that look from uh, from somewhere else? And it just looks like that. Here is uh, Jaffa. Here is uh, what we call Babel, uh, Bab Damascus Gate, Babel Amud, and here is Jaffa Gate. Uh, Jaffa Gate is where the, the new city. So if we are looking here, I mean, it's, it's just kind of uh, interesting exercise to know the space that we are talking about just to, uh, to kind of remove this uh, invisibility or this uh, shade. Um, here's Jaffa Gate that really, this is like the one that goes to the Our Hebron uh, Gate as well, that goes to the west. This is where the modernity project comes in from, the, from Jaffa. So it was opened to accommodate uh, the project, to accommodate the, the new waves that are coming from, uh, from the west, and especially the pilgrims. And here is the Damascus Gate where, it's, uh, where it looks more to the north, which goes to Ramallah, Nablus, Jenin. And it's funny enough when one comment of Salim, like uh, when, they, when the Turkish wanted to hang someone, they wouldn't hang them uh, at Jaffa Gate, they would hang them at uh, Damascus Gate because the message, the political message is for the people and the local people would come from this gate, not coming from the other gate. Uh, strangely enough, this is how the map looks in the... In the, in, the, in the eye or in the imagination. That's how it's been presented to the, to the pilgrim, pilgrim to the West. It's a, it's a place of uh, just sites. It's a, it's a place of sites, religious sites, whether uh, Muslim, Christian, uh, Jewish sites. And that is, like, that is the kind of map. I mean, this is not a specific one. I mean, this is just a, a certain one. But I know it's a bit small now. Oh, sorry, guys, but this is the, the kind of touristic map. So it's kind of removing, removing all of this uh, history and stories and fabric of life, and just seeing it as a as a dead place. I'm here. I I, I want to, um, and of course. Uh, most of the pilgrims who would come to uh, Jerusalem at the 18th, 19th century, that would be the first uh, perspective they will look at, I mean, even before coming into the city, is to come and see uh, from um, Olive Mount. I want to, um, 
to use uh, to to read a little comment by a guy called uh, Pierre Lotti. Pierre Lotti is a is a is a naval uh, officer. He's a, a writer, a French one, obviously, and he visited uh, Palestine uh, as a pilgrim, mainly Jerusalem. I mean that's uh, Pierre Lotti, and he uh, and in one in one of one of one book I found a translation of his uh, writing. The minute that he was walking from uh, Jaffa to uh, to Jerusalem. And he said uh, he, there was a car that passed him with a uh, lot of noise, like people who were in the car, they were making a lot of noise. And like he said, we were not ready for this. It's totally destroying our oriental dream. Uh, what just happened in, uh, hit our own religious belief. Oh my God. Their clothes, their shouts, laughter echoed in this holy place. Exactly when we went, we went through the street of prophets meditating in our uh, prayers. I mean, that, that really uh, kind of describes, even that happens in, uh, 19, uh, in 18, uh, uh, 94, 95, uh, which, uh, of course, we can, it's very evident that the modernity project of the Ottoman uh, happening in, uh, in, in Jerusalem, the opening of the new roads, the sanitation system, um, like the urbanization, even the clock tower was, uh, was existing at that moment. But that, that really describes the, that the way we are looking at the city, at least the pilgrims, uh, it's based on, on text. It's not based on what we are seeing in front of us. Um, in in uh, Chateaubriand, uh, Frank Corin, in his book, Itinerary from Paris to Jerusalem, 1811, which was kind of the basic uh, text that established the way that the West, I would put here between two brackets, uh, is looking at the place. And exactly from the same uh, place of Jerusalem Mount, he stand there, Chateaubriand, and said, wrote, Jerusalem houses look like a low high square blocks with no chimneys or windows. They look like tombs or jails. I mean, that is uh, the moment where he comes, that in 1811, there was maybe like around 8,000 people living in that place, but he couldn't see anything. It was, a, it was a, for him, it's, it's just a jail, a place to, uh, to think, of, to, uh, to, to remember, and somehow. I've been interested in, in, in really seeing what, what, how did that image of that place uh, was established, and um, it was funny. The other day, I went to uh, uh, La Ciute, where uh, uh, Lumiere brother uh, made their uh, first shootings. They made their first private screening, and I was thinking, like, what did what really pushed them to go the next? I mean, then they filmed in France, and then they went to Jerusalem, to to Palestine, 1905, to uh, to film there. So what, what, what was that? What was the, the place? And then I started to realize a little bit what is uh, that cinema, at least seeing how La Cité is been. I mean, I, I talked a little bit to some people there and for them this city has been, or this place has been like a, a summer place, summer, summer town for many of uh, uh, the upper middle class uh, French from the industrial uh, area. So uh, even the activity of cinema was an activity of entertainment. Uh, of, the, of that moment. It's like the, the families are there having some kind of an outside uh, night uh, uh, activity which was cinema and that kind of somehow explained why they were like filming like the first first train shot, uh, other shots uh, were filmed all around La, 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 La Cité. But also in somehow uh, thinking about uh, the, the not the religious aspect, but like the industrialization of uh, of Europe at that moment created a, a big a big crack between uh, religion and the practical life. I mean, that, that which which, is, which wasn't the separation between the church and the, the state. I mean, this is a big thing of the whole modernization of the of of, of the West and uh, to to fill up this gap and somehow uh, was the image of the holy sites, the holy place was very important and I might suspect that this is also that the Lumiere, I have to, to look more on that, but the Lumiere were uh, maybe funded by uh, kind of religious people or like uh, right wing or I don't, I don't know if that right wing is the right term now to use, but it's uh, that uh, they were funded to go and, and show, show us the, the holy land. 
but it's it's very funny like even for me i have that kind of uh, this adjustment uh, like i have i haven't that perspective to look at uh, why five minutes the, the perspective to look at the place even for me now as a as a palestinian living in ramallah and somehow i look at this uh, i try to look between the 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 shades and the the clouds of memory and try to reconstruct an image of of that place um that's why i mean we did i did this piece of work uh, was commissioned uh, by uh, by Ruwaq based on a research by uh, Khaldun Bshara, who's also based on an edited book uh, by uh, Salim and Assam Nassar. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the piece and then we can uh, maybe talk a little bit more after that. <laughs>
so I mean, this this for me really was kind of the first time that I could see, not only by uh, reading or understanding, but also by dealing with the images themselves, like uh, slicing them, cutting the buildings, going into the details of one by one, and even having that possibility of doing a 3D. I mean, the 3D images we saw here, it's not one photograph. I mean, there are sometimes three, four photographs from different perspectives that are used to build up this uh, sense that we are moving in. But uh, going, I mean, seeing, seeing how much that detailed uh, process of, uh, was, uh, just made me realize how much is interesting to, to look at that history uh, from that photographic uh, pers perspective and kind of not rebuild uh, a, a, site, a, a site scene of Jerusalem Amab, but no, we can live a, a livable experience of that moment. It's very important, uh, just like, I mean, knowing a little bit about it, like that there was a, a, a unified municipality, of, of, for example, of Jerusalem, that stayed till 1936, that unified municipality that had like six Muslim, two Christians, two Jewish, I mean, and they were running uh, the, whole, the, whole, uh, the whole city. But, um, this, again, this is a trailer of a, of a film that we're hoping uh, to be working on. It's gonna be all photographed. It's called On That Day because it focuses on that day, the turning point of uh, Allenby coming in. He was a general. I mean, this is one of the funny things, like should I talk about him as Field Marshal Allenby? But when he entered Jerusalem at that moment, he was General Allenby. So I still keep talking about him as uh, General Allenby. At the moment when General Allenby came in and like destroyed or interrupted the modernity project that was the Ottoman, but I think also that the local uh, Palestinian people were adapting that model as a way of uh, uh, managing the relationship between the endless minorities of the of the place. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, that's it for now. Maybe we can uh, have it with Q and A. It's better. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, this was really fascinating. I have two questions, one for Salim and the uh, other one for Mohanad. Uh, in Salim, that famous picture of the surrender uh, of the uh, surrender of Jerusalem, uh, December 9th, 1917, uh, did you imply that Jauhariya took it? Is that true? No. No, Jauhari did not have a camera. In the left? <laughs> Jauhari did not take that picture, right? Do you want me to answer you? No, I'm asking so I can ask my next question. Ah, uh, no, he did not. <laughs> it's taken from the collection of the American colony. No. No. Uh, is that the next question? No, no, look, he had it in his collection. That's what you said, right? Uh, Shahari <laughs> actually did not have a camera. He never took a photograph in his life. He was a collector of photographs. Collector and of photographs. Okay. his, his I'm, I'm glad you brought this question because the importance of Shahari is his annotation and commentary and the fact that he collected them and uh, uh, inventorized them. That was a bit misleading. This picture was taken by Lars Larson, who was the head photographer in the American colony. I see. And okay. he accompanied the entourage. He was, he was actually assigned to be one of the photographers of Jamal Pasha, and he accompanied the entourage of uh, Mayor Hosseini uh, in order to take a picture of that. Uh, he was the only person av available at that moment with a camera. My own research on that implies that the, this photograph is staged later in the day because of the shadow, that there was no photographer and they brought him in at the end of the day with the two soldiers who, went, who left Lefta early that morning to look for fresh eggs and a light for their cigarettes. So they bumped into the mayor and the entourage and they didn't want to take the keys because they were not looking for keys. Now, my question, this is like after this long digression, the little kid on the left 
who is usually cropped out of that picture, is an Ilya Shar. Uh, he was found years later for a documentary that Israeli TV had on that day in December, and he told the story, and I noted that in the 1915 notable picture, there's an Ilya Shar. Could it be there's a connection based on face recognition that you could find between the two? Maybe he belonged to the family of that notable, and that's the reason he was in the entourage of well, Husseini. I'll leave the answer to the second part to Mohammed. I just want to say, <laughs> I know there's controversy about that picture. Mm. The picture was taken in Sheikh Badr, which is way far from the center of the city. Uh, the story is that these were scouting, scouting, they were both sergeants. So they could not be the advanced troops of General Alambi. Uh, he would not send sergeants to receive a surrender of the city. So that part is correct. However, uh, it's unlikely, in my view, that was staged because uh, why would uh, the mayor go to Sheikh Badr again to take a picture of surrender, which is very humiliating. And he does look confused and perplexed, but mm. um, I, it's something to look into. Yeah. Uh, there is a, like a counter-narrative of this written by the commander of the unit at Lifta, who tells the same story about the, these two soldier, soldiers that appear in the picture. So this is like something that maybe... And he's the one who said it was staged? No, he talks about the soldiers. Mm -hmm. The staging is like comes later, but uh, let's uh, take this up privately afterwards. Uh, my question to Mohanad... No, this is a picture. This, this one. one. Uh, okay, yeah. okay. So this little kid who is... Uh, sneaking, this one here. Yeah. He actually has the names. Uh, I have another picture. He had them wrong. I, I remember that from the book. I have a picture with the numbers, the numbers on the, right. that's, on that's the head like of, each, of each person, yeah. indicating who they are. And it's the only one where the numbers are found into the Johariya right. collection. You, you published this in the Johariya book? Yeah. 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 My, my, my other question, I'm, I'm sorry I'm digressing. And my other question is about a, when did you say the Hamidiya Tower was demolished, blown up? It was uh, uh, blown up in early 1918 by... Uh, Before Allenby no. showed up on the 18th of December or after... Oh, much, much later. It was, the military command was already established. Uh, Allenby had withdrawn at that time, but uh, Storrs was the new military governor and mm. Charles Ashby was the city engineer, so it was, uh, actually I don't know the exact date, but it happened uh, several months after December. After, after several months into 1918. On the 18th. Yeah, but it was during 1918. Uh, my, my, my question to Mohammed. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I'm just adding that the description, uh, description of uh, Hani, of Wasif Jawhariya, uh, about that he had a model of that clock in his house oh. and he had the phonograph of the model of the clock of the Hamidi tower uh, with the phonograph in the middle and that's basically how I based the sound that is going I see. with that okay. yeah but just a, a my note. question about that tower is the in the picture you showed it shows two clocks on the top different times different times yes one is the Muslim time and the other one is Western time is it? I, I always uh, wonder, I mean, yeah. it was like... It's, it's uh, not like two okay. clocks that one shows the wrong time. It's the fact that until that, uh, that year, around the Ottoman Empire, there were two systems of time. Muslim time and Western time. Okay. This is the same case of the Hamidi Tower in Beirut in 1897. It shows the same image of two, two clocks. So the, the blowing up of that tower probably would have somehow symbolized the end of Muslim time and the beginning of Western time. Would, would that be a, a safe way of putting it? 
No, I don't. I <laughs> I don't, I don't, personally, I don't, uh, it's maybe the, the colonial time. I mean, you can, I mean, you can uh, sort of interpret it once you, you, you find out that that's what these, these mm. two faces of the clock show, because okay. in 1920, when the Allies took over Istanbul, that's when Western time was the legal time of the Middle East, okay. and Muslim time was sort of, brought out of, that, out of the picture. Okay. So, so I think this is probably mm. like a, a moment in time, so to speak, that yeah. warrants some... Definitely. I mean, the, the, this whole thing, it's like the shift between uh, the two times, the, the Ottoman, the Empire, the Muslim, the Christian, or I don't know, it's... Uh, yeah, it's definitely a question of time. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, there's a book that was published by an historian Tel Aviv University called Reading Time a la Turca. Yes, that, Emily that, mentioned that, that yes. Yeah, yes. that implied, talks about this. Uh, can I just uh, add a point? Uh, I think it's not really Muslim time, it's, uh, it's time. Zawali time, which uh, regulates the times of prayer and so on. Uh, when the Hamidian Tower was established, and there was several scores of them throughout the empire, in Palestine, there was in Haifa, in Nablus, and Jerusalem, and of course the famous one in Jaffa, which looks completely different. Uh, that one had only Western time in it, did not have, some of them had Zawali time. And it was expressly said at the time that the clock was meant to regulate the time of industrial progress and prayer time. So, he, like Muhammad Anwar Sadat, he wanted to integrate. Uh, science, technology, and Islam at the same time. He wanted to be known as the Sultan of progress and technology as well as faith. So this duality, but I, it was clear that the blowing up of the bridge uh, of the <laughs> tower was not aimed at Muslim time, but at uh, the vestiges of Ottoman presence. Yeah, okay, fine. Yes, you could say that. Salim Muhannad, uh, a remark and maybe also a question. Uh, the picture um, I think uh, that, you, that you showed um, of the tower, but also from uh, a different uh, angle of the Jaffa Gate, it showed also um, a photo or an, an image of a sabil, a fountain building. It's uh, a white um, marble. Uh, building with some black um, um, uh, stones in it. Uh, this was also was removed. So here is the idea. Perhaps maybe Ashby and uh, Stores wanted to remove anything was added by Abdel Hamid and not just the tower. So the tower is, a, as you both claim and I agree, that this is a symbol of modernity. Oh, the one before, this one, yeah. So you could see um, the tower uh, was removed in this picture, but shortly after that, they removed the fountain. And uh, so there is, or do you think that the stores, um, Ashby's plan was actually to remove anything modern and to bring, uh, you know, with this, uh, um, you know, uh, British conservation um, kind of idea is that they want to remove the modern uh, building and to keep the old ones. Don't you think that this is also part of the, 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 the plan? It was also to remove uh, not only Western symbols, but also modern uh, buildings that may have um, created uh, a false image of the city that should look really old and not to add these new buildings. Um, possibly. Uh, I think just to be fair to the British or to Charles Ashby, who was a civic councillor to stores and the city engineer, he began a process of beautification of the city, which established the green zone around the city walls. And that entailed removing all the stores and the new structures, which were a commercial structure. And the Sibyl happened to be part of that uh, 
we, what we know, maybe Mohanad knows better, the Sabil was not removed at the same time as the blowing of the clock tower. And we know that the Sabils in Jaffa and in Haifa were not removed altogether. Some of them exist until today. Uh, Charles Ashby insisted that the, in the cordon there around the city, the greening of the city entailed removing all the structures that existed. And he did remove a lot of commercial establishments and not only the Sabil. So the Sabil's removal may be part of that. But you might be right also that it was part of this campaign against the Ottoman presence. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even even uh, reading the diaries of Wasif Jauhariya, he actually agreed with uh, Charles Ashby about uh, that the tower really didn't fit as an aesthetic, uh, didn't fit the the holiness of the of the place. Which I really wonder uh, wonder why, uh, but probably because he was also working with the British and and uh, in, in, in somehow so it's uh, so you can imagine that kind of character that can uh, be that uh, pragmatic that can go with everything. But it also shows. How and it's a direct manifestation how the the West was seeing Jerusalem as a as an open museum, something that we can uh, curate and move and re and re like uh, re move and remove uh, buildings to to make it fit with a certain aesthetic to the establishment text. Like for example, Chateaubriand uh, wrote about it. Like how do we do we see this? And it's really interesting to see how how all of this uh, Oriental vision of the place kind of led to the to the disaster of of Palestine because the minute we couldn't. The they couldn't see uh, the, the fabric, the society. It's only we are seeing the past and the image we have, uh, or the text we are building up from Im the image we are building up of text that in somehow led to uh, the disaster of the Palestinian people. So if I would say uh, what is the disaster, of course there is a political colonial interest and all of that, but it's also there is a kind of a, uh, a dilemma between Palestinians and image. And this, uh, this, this dilemma, it's, uh, it starts with the photography, it starts with the early photography, with the early missionaries who are holding cameras, are filming the place um, as they imagine, not as it exists. And that's one of the power that camera can, uh, can give us, actually. Yeah. Je suis désolé, mais, uh, on Sorry, doit, but uh, finish we this conference. Uh, finish now. Dinner is served, and really there sorry, will we have be to a screen here. later on. Dinner is served, and then there's a, another film. Thank you so much, Salim and Mohamed. Fascinating. Enriching. <laughs>